and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Kanishka Gupta. It's the 23rd of October 2023 and here are the questions we will be answering today. Why is the Supreme Court worried about NCLT and NCLAT? Can airport operators raise charges as demand goes up? Will markets bounce back this week? And what was the Mandal Commission? NCLT and NCLAT have got down to a rot now. Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachud made this harsh observation last week while issuing a contempt notice to two members of the appellate tribunal. The two NCLAT members allegedly ignored a status quo order passed by the Apex Court and issued an order in a dispute relating to Phenolex cables. So why is the Supreme Court worried about these two quasi-judicial bodies? Ayush Mishra dials the experts to find out. The Supreme Court on October 18th issued notice to two members of National Company Law Appellate Tribunal or NCLAT asking them as to why contempt proceedings should not be initiated against them. The reason? They allegedly defied the SC directions in a dispute relating to Finolex cables. But what is the Finolex cables case? The matter pertains to an annual general meeting or AGM of Finolex cables and the feud between cousins Prakash Chabria and Deepak Chabria over the company's control. The Supreme Court had, on October 13th, issued a status quo on the Finolex Cables AGM results, but the NCLAT went ahead and ruled that Deepak Chabria would remain the chairman of Finolex Cables. Prakash Chabria then filed a contempt petition, which the Supreme Court took into consideration. The Apex Court then asked the NCLAT chairperson to conduct an inquiry. After the submission of the inquiry report, the court issued contempt notices to the two members of NCLAT. Three judge bench of the Supreme Court led by Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrachud observed that NCLT and NCLAT have got down to a rot now. The bench also directed the members to appear before it on October 30. But why did the top court make such a strong statement against NCLAT? If the Honorable Supreme Court also wanted you to announce, to pronounce the appeal, once you have been apprised of the, uh, the AGM report, and you are yourself saying that after 2.40 p.m., that is on 5.35 p.m., we were apprised of the Supreme Court order, then you had no reason to suspend your own order, if that is the stand which the bench has taken. But... Nonetheless, they pronounced the order on 13.10 and then they suspended their own order on 16.10, which the Supreme Court uh, could not digest because that prima facie showed that there is something wrong, there is something uh, murky, waters are there and uh, the Supreme Court thereafter had to take that strict stance. The Supreme Court was concerned, it wanted to ascertain uh, whether there was a willful violation of the orders of the court. And uh, obviously, uh, all subordinate courts are bound by orders of Supreme Court. Uh, they cannot be any willful violation. And therefore, the subordinate judiciary is required. All courts and tribunals which are subordinate to Supreme Court are required to follow the authority of Supreme Court. I think that's broadly the principle which the Supreme Court wanted to make sure was being followed. And therefore, it asked for a report from the chairperson of NCLT. So what can be done to set things right? There need to be a standard operating procedure. Not that we don't have uh, an, uh, SOPs in place, but especially for mentioning, we need to have a standard operating procedure, which to one extent should also be in an online format that at least that would create a timestamp. Because so to say today that we, I can, as a council, I conveyed that order. But there is no timestamp to it. To it's 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 a hearsay. You are saying you conveyed it. The bench is saying we did not get it. So how even if it reaches to a higher appellate authority, there is no way to actually determine what really transpired during that period. If I believe if we can have a timestamp, uh, if we have we can have a online submission of applications for mentioning, uh, special in such cases, in such uh, cases, you know, when there is a, a direction from the honorable Supreme Court. That would uh, be enough 
for the bench also to uh, take care of it efficient and transparent resolution of corporate disputes and insolvency cases is crucial for a robust business environment the allegations of rot and the issuance of contempt notices highlight the need for immediate reforms and accountability in these important institutions Let us now move on to another big news the cricket world cup airlines operating charter flights to and fro ahmedabad carrying cricketers and fans are in a bind and fuming too the adani group owned ahmedabad airport has sharply raised user charges for these special flights but can airport operators raise charges as demand goes up well kasturiya kill finds out When airlines that have taken the BCCI contract to carry players and officials for the ongoing ICC Cricket World Cup touched down at Ahmedabad Airport last week, they were in for an unexpected surprise. The airport has proposed a tenfold increase in user charges for the charter flights, triggering a backlash from major airlines. While the airlines have asserted that the sudden hike is illegal and will render charter operations unaffordable, the Adani Group owned airport cited a higher than usual surge in traffic necessitated extra resources from the Ahmedabad airport as charter operations do not adhere to a fixed schedule. The Ahmedabad airport issued a tariff list last month that showed the airport has levied a minimum of 265000 rupees general aviation charges on charter flights that carry more than 15 passengers above which an additional charge of 17667 rupees will apply per passenger these charges are in addition to the landing and parking fees But do airports have the authority to raise user charges based on the sporadic increase in airline operations? Every five years, which there there are control periods, ERA determines tariff, right? And there is a ceiling which has been given. Now, under that ceiling, which which has been given, uh, the airport operator can charge uh, the fees that they want from the users. So if it's within the ambit of aeronautical charges uh, era obviously has uh, the jurisdiction however uh, within the ceiling if the airport author, uh, operator charges it is fine if it is beyond the ceiling obviously it needs to go back to the uh, uh, to era for approval now what adani has charged additional is obviously uh, something that era and and uh, the operator which is the concessionaire here adani needs to uh, deliberate whether they come under aeronautical services or non aeronautical services uh, that 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 is something which can be easily easily determined according to media reports the airport economic regulatory authority has issued notice to the airport indicating that airport charges and tariffs that are not authorized by it are illegal While airports are not allowed to increase aeronautical charges, the Adani owned airport argues that the charges it levied are non-aeronautical in nature and hence seeking ERA's approval wasn't necessary. However, Air India veteran Jitendra Bhargava disputes the airport's rationale. He elaborates on why the airport's argument doesn't hold ground. What we generally understand is that non-aeronautical charges are those which you have it in the terminal. the duty free shopping the shopping arcade that you have the eateries that you have at an airport etc but anything to do with the tarmac constitutes aeronautical traffic and that is what we normally take it and that is what era will also take while approving the charges for any you know any airport management when they look at all the parameters and say how do we ensure that airports get adequate returns you look at the total traffic look at the tariff and look at the cost and they advertise much earlier in this case it wasn't known to the airlines till such time they had already contracted their businesses with the bccci etc for charters running of charters and then they certainly caught unawares this is simply not done 
Justifying the raised charges, a senior airport official told media outlets that the hiked fees were applicable for charter flights operating beyond designated hours during the World Cup matches. These flights incur higher costs for the airport due to the deployment of additional manpower and the extra services to passengers on board. Aviation experts point out that if the surge in air traffic during the World Cup genuinely posed a concern, other airport operators should have also raised their charges. And in situations where tariff hikes are inevitable, adequate justification should be given to the regulatory authority to get their case examined and approved accordingly. An arbitrary modification in tariff rates in any other case is inadmissible, experts contend. It's not just fans. This World Cup is keeping stocks of companies and hospitality, food and beverages and travel sectors in good spirits too. But it's not the case for the larger market. And unease has gripped it. Higher for longer interest rates, a likely slowdown in global economy, the Israel-Hamas war and fears of a further escalation has further dented the sentiment. How much of an impact will these events have on the Indian market and what should be your investment strategy? Rex Cano finds out in our next report. A sharp surge in US Treasury bond yields to a 16-year high of 5% mark last week triggered a risk of sentiment in global equity markets amid escalating tensions in West Asia. Analysts feel the markets have not fully factored in the rising friction in West Asia. Indian markets were no different, trading weak for most part of the last week. The S&P BSE index shed 885 points or 1.34% to 65,398, while the NSE Nifty 50 index declined a little over 1% to 19,543. Among the broader indices, even as BSE mid-cap index shed 1.3%, the small cap managed to end a wee bit higher. Sectorally, the BSE Realty, Capital Goods and FMCG indices were the worst hit. Another sore point for the markets is the surge in crude oil prices beyond the $93 mark in the backdrop of the ongoing Israel-Palestine war. In the last fortnight, Brent oil prices have flared over 12%, data shows. Over the next few days, the market will continue to seek direction from global peers with an eye on crude oil prices. Stock-specific moves, meanwhile, are likely to continue on account of the September quarter earnings. The markets will remain closed on Tuesday on account of Desera. If the crude oil prices are going to continue to be at a elevated levels on a higher range, definitely it's going to have some kind of negative impact on the Indian economy in medium to short term. But overall, Indian economy is quite strong. We are in the beginning of the earnings season. So far, there were no negative surprises with respect to uh, earnings are concerned. IT stocks have been uh, uh, given a guidance of flattish kind of uh, guidance at this point of time. Uh, we had a good set of numbers coming from FMCG companies like uh, HUL, ITC and um, Nestle have come up with a strong set of numbers. So overall, we are in the middle of the earnings season. Earnings season is going to drive the markets uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming week. The good thing with respect to Indian market is that at a lower range of the market, we are witnessing more about the buying interest. There is a stock specific action is taking place at this point of time. Capital goods, auto sector uh, remains to be the outperforming sector in the coming weeks because of the we can expect a good set of numbers from these companies. This week, the earnings season is about to pick up pace with as many as 210 companies scheduled to announce their September quarter results. Prominent among these are Axis Bank, Jubilant Foodworks, Tech Mahindra, Asian Paints, Bajaj Finserv, Dr. Reddy's and Maruti. Technically, the market has entered a crucial phase with the Nifty 50 quoting below its short-term moving averages. Going ahead, charts indicate that the Nifty may test support around its 100-day moving average at 19,400. The Sensex may seek support around 65,100 and 64,800. 
while it may face resistance around 65,900 and 66,200 this week. Similarly, the Nifty 50 index is expected to seek support around 19,450 and 19,400 and face resistance around 19,650 and 19,750. He's making plans for an early retirement. Business Standard Markets will also keep a tap on the upcoming state polls. Its result may set the tone for general elections due next year, but some believe the tone has already been set. Car survey conducted in Bihar has everyone talking. It's also been called the Mandal 2.0. But what was the original Mandal Commission? Vasudha Mukherjee offers insight. The Socially and Educationally Backward Classes Commission, better known as the Mandal Commission, was named after its chairman, B.P. Mandal. The commission was set up on 1st January 1979 by then Prime Minister Morarji Desai. While the constitution that was adopted in 1950 provided reservations to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, demand for similar support for other backward classes or OBCs arose too. Some states in South India implemented state-level reservation policies, but a comprehensive nationwide policy was not there. The Commission's primary duty was to address issues faced by the OBCs. It had to establish what criteria would define India's socially and educationally backward classes. They then had to recommend steps that could be taken to help advance these classes and also assess reservations for state and central government jobs. The Commission conducted surveys, gathered data and consulted experts to identify communities that warranted reservation benefits. It suggested inclusion of backward classes who were already considered backward by other castes or classes, who were manual labor dependent and if their family assets were significantly below the state average. In 1980, the Commission also conducted a nationwide socio-economic survey and gathered data from villages and urban areas across 405 districts. Combining this data with the 1961 census, state backward class lists and personal knowledge, the Commission compiled a national list of 3,743 OBC and 2,108 depressed backward classes. On 31st December 1980, the Mandal Commission submitted its report. The recommendations included a 27% reservation for OBCs in government jobs and educational institutions. Nearly a decade later, on 7th August 1990, Prime Minister V.P. Singh announced the implementation of the Mandal Commission's recommendations. PM Singh stated before the Parliament that OBCs would be given 27% reservation in central government jobs and other public sector units. This was met with widespread protests and debates. Critics argued that the reservation policies could lead to reverse discrimination and lower merit-based selection. On 16 November 1992, the Supreme Court upheld the Commission's quota for OBC and the recommendations were gradually enforced. Trusted Bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Reservations for OBCs in educational institutes did not take place till 2006 and still many educational institutes do not have any reservation in teaching posts. Well, that's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log on to business-standard.com. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.